Good morning. I'm Jimmy Asbel, one of the pastors at Vineville United Methodist Church in Macon, Georgia. And I want to thank you for tuning in to this broadcast. What you will see this morning is a rebroadcast of last Sunday's service. We're glad that you've tuned in and hope that you find this a meaningful worship experience. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. We're so glad that you're joining with us in worship this morning. I want to remind you to register your attendance and all those who are watching along with you by sending an email to viablemethodist at gmail.com along with any prayer requests or praises that you might have so our prayer team can pray with you and for you. There are many opportunities online to stay connected with God and one another while we are apart. You can find those on our Facebook page or in the Vine email that you've received this week. Thursday, June 18th, we will have another blood drive. And there's a big need at this time, so if you are able to give blood, be sure to go online to the Red Cross website or more easily, contact Ron Thompson to reserve your spot. There will be no walk-ins at this time, so we can be sure to maintain safe distancing guidelines. Next Sunday will be a very special day in worship that you will not want to miss. We will be honoring our senior class, naming scholarship award winners, and Mike Kennebrew will be preaching. So be sure to turn, tune in next week for that service. Our lovely flowers this morning are placed in honor of Ferd and Lori Kay, given by Shannon, Mary Virginia, and Jeff. And we also have a rosebud to recognize the birth of Evelyn Louise Keetle, daughter of Sarah and Carl, and granddaughter to Ken and Gina Keetle. This week, uh, our world has been busy, full of uncertainty and chaos of opportunities taken and ignored, both full of joy and sadness. And so we set aside this time in our week to pause and worship together, certain that God is worthy of our praise and thanksgiving. So let us prepare ourselves for worship as Elizabeth plays our morning voluntary.
Hey, good morning. Welcome to worship. Thank you for joining us. You know, for, for 40 years, I came to church. Um, but now, you can't come to church, but church is coming to you. And uh, you are the church, so, uh, so we can worship together from wherever you are. So uh, join us. I've loved this song for about as long as I can remember. It's an old one as far as the praise and worship goes. It says, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture. We're the sheep of his hand. It's good to be reminded that we don't have to bear the weight of the world on our shoulders. You're just the sheep and you're in his hand. The sheep don't have to worry about the food or protection from their enemies. Sometimes we think too highly of ourselves. It's good to be reminded. It's comforting just to be a lamb in the hand of the shepherd. Come let us worship and bow down Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker Come let us worship and bow down Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Sheep of his hand, 
just the sheep of his hand. Come, let us worship. Let's join together by affirming our faith with these words from Romans. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. I invite our children to um, come down and join us, however you're doing that at home. Uh, but this is a time when normally you would all be gathered here uh, with me down front and uh, uh, always appreciate the time we have together. I want to talk a little bit about our Bible. Um, you know, the Bible is not just a book, but it's a book full of books. So we've got... Um, uh, lessons about a real, really long time ago, like from the beginning, we've got history and stories in Genesis and Exodus. Um, we've got stories about different times in the history of Israel. And uh, in the New Testament, uh, in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we've got stories about Jesus' life and, and teaching. And we've got letters uh, that were written to early churches at Corinth and Philippi and Thessaloniki. And so um, there are all kinds of different things in the Bible. But if you sort of flip your Bible open to the middle... Uh, there's a book that's called the Book of Psalms. 
And, and this is a collection um, of prayers and songs. Uh, so a psalmist is sort of a singer-songwriter from a long, long time ago. And uh, the psalms um, remind us, they, they used to sing them, uh, and, and they were prayers and songs from, from a long time ago, and, and they're really useful for us today. And our lesson today comes out of Psalm 100, and, and I'm just going to talk about one verse in our time here together. It says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Make a joyful noise. Now, um, maybe you think about when, when we make a joyful noise. If, if, our, uh, if our team is really, uh, is really winning big over our uh, arch rivals, we might uh, holler and cheer and, and be real, make a huge joyful noise um, that, we're, that things are going well. Or if uh, we are excited about a birthday present, um, I've got a new PS5. You know, somebody cheers. Or uh, if a, if a famous um, singer came in, if we were to um, one Sunday walk in and uh, Taylor Swift were to walk out here and sing a solo, somebody might um, make a joyful noise, right? There might be um, some special noise excitement. Birthday present, you get exactly what you want. Or at Christmas, um, there are, you get an A on a test. Um, you know, there, there are reasons to, to shout out with uh, excitement. Well, we, we all have some reasons, and the Bible talks about reasons um, uh, that we could share that are God reasons uh, that we would share excitement, that we would make a joyful noise to the Lord. And one of those is that we are created uh, in the image of God, uh, that God made all that is, that creation, it's a wonderful thing. All you have to do is look at these beautiful flowers behind me uh, and to know that there, there are things in creation that are worth celebrating, that are just amazing. And, and God made us, and not only did God make us, but God loves us. God loves us and won't let us go. And so there are lots of things for us to make a joyful noise about. So here's the, here's the assignment for this week. I want you to look for things, at least one thing every day. And, and parents, you can help us with this. Let's talk about it, maybe around the table as a family. Um, what's something uh, that made you want to make a joyful noise today? And every day, think about Things that make you want to make a joyful noise. Let's celebrate the wonder of who God is uh, and this beautiful, amazing world that God has made. And let's, let's be a congregation that makes a joyful noise. Let's pray. God, you made an amazing world. We are grateful. Uh, we, we love you and we are so uh, so amazed at the world that's around us. We ask your, your blessings. Help us to see our eyes to be open that we might bring a joyful noise of praise, that we might celebrate who you are and the good gifts all around us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. we come to the time when normally our ushers would be coming forward, let's just join together for a few minutes of prayer. Gracious God, it is clear when we stop and slow down all of the wonders around us, there are so many blessings that we have to be joyful and thankful for. We ask that you would open our eyes to see them and our hearts to experience them. We give thanks for all of the many ways that we have been able to continue to be the church during this time, and for the generosity and the outpouring of love that has continued. We give thanks for your continued presence with us and ask for continued blessings to all of your children each and every day. In your name we pray. Amen.
bless his name always. For it is seemly so to do. Oh, why the Lord our God is good, his mercy is forever sure, his truth Let's pray. O Lord, life is one of the greatest gifts that you have granted us. It is because of our very existence that we experience all other blessings. Laughter, love, excitement, marvel, peace, kindness, and joy. All of these gifts come through the blessing of life. When life takes unexpected turns and lead us, leads us places that we don't wish to go, you have given us friends and family to support us. You have created the church as a place to lay our heads and be nourished by your spirit. You have created mountains and oceans stars and sunsets that bring joy and peace to our souls. It is through your unrelenting love of creation that everything came to be and continues to be. May we always seek to emulate your love, to cry out for it and to embrace it. But even as we experience your love, Lord, you know that we are tired we are tired of being isolated and not allowed to visit friends or family or to go about our lives freely. We are tired of worrying and wondering when or even if life will be normal again. We are tired of watching lives being taken, of fights breaking out, of the pointing of fingers and demonizing or belittling of those on the other side. We are tired. And it has been a long and hard few months for our country and for our world. But it is in these moments of weariness that we turn to you. There is a healing balm that comes from our faith and trust in your presence and your promises. We rejoice in knowing that we are your children. We have been fearfully and wonderfully made in your image and carry a piece of that divine spark within us. We know that you are faithful to your children enduring with them through all generations. We have witnessed more times than we can count your goodness and love towards us. We praise you for abiding in us and shining through us, for dwelling among us and transforming us. We pray that you would be with our children this week during our online VBS. May they learn to know more fully of your love for them and to grow in their own faith. And we give thanks for Reese and for all of the volunteers who worked hard to make sure our children are still being fed during this time apart. Holy God, help us to live as people who have been called to spread the good news. Empower us to be your hands and feet in the world. And may we show compassion and mercy, forgiveness to others as we receive it from you. And may we continue to open our hearts and minds to the works of your Holy Spirit. As one body united through your love, we remember the words that your Son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture lesson for today is from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. The word of God for God's people today. Thanks be to God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Noise. The word here literally means a sound that splits the ear. Now, I don't think the psalmist was saying we have to scream, yell, or pull out all the organ stops every time we worship. It's not to suggest that the depth of our devotion is best measured with a decibel meter, but I do believe it means we are not to be timid or noncommittal in worship. The psalmist is talking about energy and enthusiasm and excitement. In the book of Revelation, John gives us a glimpse into worship in heaven, uh, and it is exciting and expressive. It is emotional, and it is enthusiastic. Too many times our worship uh, in too many places is flat. It's less than full-throated I had a conversation recently with someone who who said that during the live streaming, they find themselves singing songs they don't know and singing louder at home than when they are at church. The psalmist would be pleased, make a joyful noise. Now, I don't know about you, but right now, I, I imagine that people hear that phrase, that verse, and they think, now? Make a joyful noise now? Really? How, how can we make a joyful noise right now? With 113,000 deaths during the pandemic in the U.S. and over 400,000 around the world, a joyful noise? With our racially charged environment, with protests both both peaceful and violent in the streets, with anxiety rising with every newscast, make a joyful noise? How do we make a joyful noise when businesses are failing, when jobs have disappeared? Thousands right here in our very own community uh, experience food insecurity. Joyful? Now? Now? How is it possible, given such misery? The psalmist calls us to look at the big picture. Let all of the earth rejoice in God, our creator, in spite of racial prejudice and injustice, in spite of a fragile economy. Uh, Let's be glad in the divine presence in spite of illness. Let's sing praise in spite of poverty and hunger. Look death in the eye and make a joyful noise. Face evil and shout Hosanna now. Yeah, yes, even now. Why? How? Why? Because God is God and, and God is good. Some of you have heard that call and response, may have done it in other places. I served a church that every time we gathered, that affirmation, that call and response happened. God is good, and the response is all the time, and all the time, God is good. I I invite you, even from where you're sitting at home, to to do that with me this morning. They're actually going to put the words on the screen so you won't, won't get mixed up if it's a new thing. So the affirmation, the call and response is, God is good. And the answer is, all the time. All the time, 
God is good. It's true. And it's true of all the earth. Animal, plant, mineral, men, women, and children belong to this great good God. And the intention and final destination of the entire universe is harmony and peaceful coexistence, desiring the best for the other. And even though one culture or another or all of them together may appear to be racing towards self-destruction, love is steadfast and God's love endures forever. Therefore, a joyful noise has been, is, and always will be appropriate. Hugo Rahner wrote, Existence is a joyful thing because it is secure in God. It is also a tragic thing because freedom always involves peril. It is a mixture of joy and sorrow, a comedy and a tragedy all in one. Most of us have been to benefits where we, the worlds of suffering and rejoicing come together. Think about it. We, we pack the city auditorium. The, the grapevine band is playing. Food, drinks, dancing. It's a night filled with laughter and joy. But we're there to raise money to fight cancer or Alzheimer's or some other source of min- misery. The psalmist is confident in God and so comfortably, so confident that he is comfortable calling for a joyful noise even before it is complete. Worship the Lord. Now this seems kind of unnecessary, kind of pretty obvious, not very insightful. Of course we're going to worship the Lord. Why, Why does the Bible need to tell us to worship God? Well, theologians have pointed out all through the centuries, that we human beings, we engage in acts of worship whether we believe in God or not. We we will uh, orient our lives around something. We all find things that we consider worthy of praise, uh, a finely crafted musical instrument, a beautiful car, a boat, a perfect golf swing, a particularly talented actor or musician, A beautiful panorama that appears when we round the bend and we say, amazing, or that's awesome. We make it clear that we've encountered something that we find praiseworthy. Now, whether that praise rises to the level of worship is another matter. Worship is a form of praise. It is praise that is particularly intense and that is sustained over a period of time. We all have different forms and levels of devotion, not all directed towards God. In fact, many of us are are generous with our praise, offering it to consumer goods, a great meal, a work of art, or a wide assortment to people. Go into a football game, 100,000 people assembled on Saturday afternoon, or a rock concert, or a political rally, and, and the levels of adoration and praise are difficult to distinguish from worship. The Hebrew word that is used in the psalm for worship, it means to orient one's life towards or around something. It makes, it makes me want to ask the question, What is the thing that my life is oriented towards? What is the thing that my life is built around? What gets the most of my time, energy, thought, and resources? Because the truth is, for many of us, if an outside observer were to try to determine what we worship based on how we spend our time and energy, God might be fairly far down the list. Think about our calendars our to-do list, our checkbooks. What is the witness of these things? What, What do they say that we worship? We may be surprised to find that we are divided in our allegiances, which is not a new thing. St. Augustine wrote centuries ago that many human difficulties arise uh, from our tendency to love the things that we ought to use and to use the things we ought to love. We can get so wrapped up in the materials and the methods that we employ to live our lives that, that we start treating the objects 
as the ends in themselves. We start to enjoy the objects so much that we, we enjoy the objects without ever achieving the goals. And on the other hand, sometimes we endure the, endow the things that are truly worthy of our affection, we, like God and other people. We only treat them as if they have value for what they do for us, what they can help us get. In face of these difficulties and with the human propensity for confusion, Scripture has an important word for us. One of the purposes of the Psalms in general and of Psalm 100 in particular is to clarify and reaffirm that God alone is worthy of worship. By keeping this psalm before our eyes, by allowing it to be written on our hearts, we are more likely to use what should be used and love what should be loved rather the other way around. Worship the Lord. Come into his presence with singing. God's gift of music is a magnificent thing. It is, it is healing. It is comforting. It lifts the hearts and the spirits. Music reaches to places that words alone can't. In my first appointment, I had a woman in the congregation who had had a stroke, and she couldn't talk. The, the words just wouldn't come. When she tried to talk, it was senseless babble. You couldn't make out even a syllable. But if standing by her hospital bed, I would start to sing, she could join in. The words were perfect, and she smiled from ear to ear. Nursing homes love to have people come visit and bring music to the residents because eyes light up and troubled minds drift away to other healthier, happier times. Psalm 100 calls us to sing which brings me to how. How? How are we going to do this? How will we answer this ancient call? As we continue to study and prepare to be together for in-person worship next month, one of the biggest downers has been all of the articles and guidelines about not singing. But choral directors and epidemiologists, infection control specialists, and other experts have all come to the same conclusion. When we come together, we will not have congregational singing, at least for a while. There was an article in the Macon paper about this very thing last Sunday. Maybe you saw it. On our conference webpage, there are numerous articles uh, that come to the same conclusion that when we sing, um, the particles, the potential virus uh, in those particles goes further than the social distancing. And, and the heavy breathing of sustained singing increases the likelihood of infection. Uh, and so we'll not be able to sing as a congregation. There'll be no choir for a while. We'll have to rely on our soloist for the foreseeable future. And, and we've been blessed with great singers but I have to tell you that the idea of gathering for worship and not singing along depresses me. M music is an important part of music for me, as I know it is for many of you. And what's doubly frustrating is we work hard to not teach the habit of watching worship. And we'll be forced for a season to teach the very habit that we've been trying to break. Mike uh, and the choir, all of the musicians, they want to lead us in worship. They, they want us to join them. They want us to sing. We do our best to not make worship a spectator sport where some up front do it and others watch like some kind of holy voyeurs. So how will we make a joyful noise without singing? Maybe, maybe this is the time we're going to learn to clap. <laughs> Or pat our legs or tap our foot or snap our fingers. I, I, I don't know. We're still exploring what it will look like, what it will sound like. How? How will we make a joyful noise? At least where you are right now, you can sing as loud as you want. You, you can make a sound that splits the ear. Know that the Lord is God. It's he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Verse 3 is about belonging. 
The identity of the people of Israel was intricately connected to their relationship with God. For the Israelites belonging to God came with the responsibility of living their lives in ways that are pleasing to God. Living godly lives was not easy for them. It was hard work. It impacted every aspect of life, including their diet and dress, their relationships and worship. By following the law, the people of Israel, they, they lived very different lives from their neighbors. They, they were set apart. They stood out. People could look at them and know they belonged to God. What does belonging to God mean? mean for us today does belonging to God or being in relationship with God influence our human relationships should our relationships um, be evident uh, that we are in relationship to God should should our relationship with God be evident in the way we interact with others does belonging to God influence our business decisions Does belonging to God affect what we put out on social media? To cut to the chase and shorten the list of questions, are there any areas of life that should not be influenced by our relationship with God? Are we willing to and or have we already compromised compromised on our principles so that we can belong or so that we can get ahead? Some of you will remember Tennessee Ernie Ford used to sing a song about a coal miner who dug 16 tons to find himself another day older and deeper in debt. You remember the the refrain of that song? St. Peter, don't you call me because I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Sometimes we let ourselves get obligated to the wrong things. And those obligations can have consequences. There there was a head football coach who was searching for a slogan uh, to inspire his players during a particularly miserable spring practice. He, He put something up on the locker room bulletin board material to try to motivate them. It said in big letters, those who stay will be champions. A disgruntled player added a line underneath it when the coach was not around. It said, and those who don't will be doctors, lawyers, and CEOs. Sometimes we trade away more than we realize when we make choices around what we will orient our lives. We are God's people. We belong to God and we should not give anything that place. And part of our worship is to be reminded to whom we belong and to push away those things that are vying to take God's place. Enter his courts with praise. Without some knowledge of ancient geography of Jerusalem, we would miss this. You see, in Jerusalem, the temple and the residence of the king sat next to each other. So when the psalmist says, enter his courts with praise, the psalmist is checking for proper order and orientation. We enter God's courts with praise, not the earthly leaders. We are making it clear that our first allegiance is to God. We enter God's courts and we offer praise. As strange as it may sound, to offer praise in a pandemic, that is the direction of Scripture. One of my teachers described praise as an act of sanity. Walter Brueggemann wrote these words in 1985, but listen to how relevant they still are. Obviously, our world is at the edge of insanity, and we with it. Inhumaneness is developed as a scientific enterprise. Greed is celebrated as economic advance. Power runs unbridled to destructiveness. In a world like this one, Psalm 100 is an act of sanity, whereby we are reclothed in our rightful minds. Life is no longer self-grounded, but rooted in thanks and praise. 
praise of God assures us that we are centered around and focused on the right things. Because it's easy. It's easy to lose focus and it's easy to lose touch. He was a young naval officer. He had been for a season assigned to the destroyer. He was given the assignment to take the ship out of the harbor. It was his first big assignment. He wanted to get it just right. He was a bright young officer. He had great training. And and in a moment's time on deck, he had everything buzzing. He was barking commands. Everything was moving like a Swiss clock. They sailed out of the harbor without a flaw. They were on their way in record time. Someone came to the bridge and said, I have a message from the captain. He thought it was odd because it looked like it came from the radio room. He read the message. Commander, you have done an excellent job. You have done it with great speed. You have dotted your I's and crossed your T's. You have gone by the book. But there is an unwritten rule that you have overlooked. The next time you leave the harbor, make certain the captain is on the boat. In his haste, in his haste, he had sailed without the most important person on board. Life can get like that. It can get hectic. We can get so focused on the task that we lose our connection to our captain. It doesn't take long. It's easy to get distracted. Worship and the Psalms in particular remind us that no matter how wise we think we are, uh, no matter how great we think our plans, no matter how much we think we are capable of handling, we better make sure that the captain is on board. Psalm 100 ends with a proclamation of God's steadfast love that endures to all generations. We All of us are the recipients of God's never-ending love and faithfulness. Throughout the Bible, from cover to cover, we see that when God's people have called on God, even when they have been disobedient, God has heard their cries and God has come to their rescue. God continues to be faithful, even, even when we are not. Even when we turn our back on God, God remains faithful. And that ought to make us say, wow. Wow, that is amazing. That is love. And that wow, that good news is why there can be joy. Joy in God that the psalmist believe should be expressed with great fervor and zeal. Words like gladness and singing and thanksgiving and praise call the people of God to worship with everything we have, body and voice, spirit and mind. I have seen some of you at football games and in the stands at basketball games and you can make noise. I have seen us make noise together at birthdays and anniversaries and graduations and weddings and promotions. If we can celebrate people and events with energy and enthusiasm, how much more should we bring to God? This God who refuses to let us go. This God who is with us in the midst of all that we endure. This God who is our future and our future is secure. Today, we are not all together in one place. But nonetheless, together, let's enter God's presence with singing. I invite you to make some noise, some joyful noise in response to God's wow. Let's lift our voice and split the ear. To God be the glory, great things he has done.
Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest offender who truly glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But pure and higher and great Transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Go come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. You know, it's a good exercise for all of us, not just the children, to try every day to find the things which make us want to make a joyful noise as a way to make sure that our lives are built around, oriented towards the right things. May God bless you and I as we move into the world and make a joyful noise in celebrating the wow of God's love. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.